so I guess uh, call to order. Um, uh, I need a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. So moved. Seconded. All right. <laughs> can I? Um, can I interrupt? Sorry about that. Are, are, is anyone via Zoom? Are you hearing anything? I can barely hear. Can you hear? It's really. It's super super quiet. Yeah. I seconded a motion. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> is it mm -hmm. is it loud enough now? Better? No. Try now. Uh, okay, how about now? Better? <laughs> it's I would say it's not great. Um <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to hear hear much. What if we talk really close to our microphones? <laughs> really That's loudly, better. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we're good. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, motion to approve the minutes was seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Aye. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, do we have any public appearances for non agenda items for? Uh, uh, don't don't think we do. Okay. Uh, all right. So tonight's agenda is is uh, going to be just the single item. We got some uh, wonderful people who came to speak with us from different organizations around the neighborhood, uh, around the city rather, uh, and uh, we're going to talk with them and see what their uh, experience uh, has been. So we'll head right into agenda items. Um, so we have. Three people uh, here to chat with us tonight, and we've got uh, Jill Wood, Director of Development for the Big Brothers Big Sisters. Uh, this of Dane County, right? <laughs> the the piece of paper, right. yeah, the piece of paper in front of me says Madison, but um, it is Dane <laughs> County. Yes, okay. Yes, uh, yes correct. Yes, f fantastic. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, so we'll have you you chat uh, you, you talk first. Um, yeah, uh, welcome. Uh, can you just give us a, a rundown of what uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Dane County uh, does as an organization? Oh, we have a presentation. Fantastic. Yes. Well, given the technological issues, is this visible? Uh, are we working with the PowerPoint? Great. Yeah. Um, okay. Jill Wood, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Dane County. Of Dane County. Um, I appreciate um, the opportunity to come chat with you tonight. It was a really good exercise at our agency. You know, we look at the youth that we serve in a lot of different ways, but it's not often that we kind of pull some out to look at as kind of a specific cohort, right? Like we're meeting needs of individual families. We might be looking at certain ages or certain, you know, groups, but um, in kind of preparing some thoughts to share with you tonight, we pulled out all the youth and kind of looked very specifically at that cohort of youth that live in the priority neighborhoods. Um, and it was really valuable, I think, for us to see um, some of the trends that are not going to probably be ex um, like surprising to you all, given the work that's going into these neighborhoods and, and what needs um, are apparent. But um, but anyway, I'm, I'm glad that we had the opportunity to kind of talk through some of this um, just uh, from an agency perspective. So. Um, I, most of you are probably familiar with our works, uh, being one of the grantees that has been supported by, um, the grant for the last, I think we have been part of all of the, um, grant cycle since the beginning. So this is our, our fourth potentially, um, and, uh, have been able to create a lot of impact with those funds. So we're, we're very grateful for them. Um, but assuming there's some familiarity, I'll just kind of briefly, um, remind you, our mission is to create and support one-to-one -one mentoring relationships that ignite the power and promise of youth. Um, so really focused on individual relationships between adult volunteers in our community and youth in our community. We serve about 500 youth annually, um, ranging from age six all the way up to 18. Um, and we have four different mentoring programs. Um, three are kind of school and site-based, uh, but the majority of our youth are enrolled in our community-based mentoring program, which is what this grant helps support. 
Um, and in that program, that's what most people know of with Big Brothers Big Sisters, where we have an adult volunteer that gets together with their, their little two to four times a month um, and spends quality time together. It's not tutoring. It's not... Um, you know, there might be goals they're working on at the match, but the, you know, kind of success in the model of our program is really built on establishing a trusting adult relationship and the impact that happens in all these areas of a kid's life because they have someone in their corner. Um, and so our impact data shows that littles in our program experience. I think these are the indicators that overlap a lot with what the Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative is trying to accomplish. Um, but engagement in fewer risky behaviors, greater social emotional competency, increased connection with others, and increased educational success and aspirations. Um, so that's kind of what we do. Um, and uh, the specifics, though, of like who we're serving, what's happening in the priority neighborhoods. Um, don't worry, all the plots on this map are not kids that we're saying are priority neighborhood kids. <laughs> it's a map of all of the kids in our program, um, but you can see kind of where the neighborhood outlines are. Um, the blue are kids that are in active matches. The yellow dots are kids that are on our wait list. One dot can represent a lot of kids, right? That they might have one apartment complex that has one address and there might be seven of our littles that are represented by that one point, but you can still kind of get like a general sense of what our spread is and where we're supporting the youth that are, um, are kind of under this umbrella. Um, looking at that spread, you know, more than half of our youth are coming from that Fish Hatchery Road corridor. Um, and we have a lot of youth that have the same, you know, that are on the same street that, you know, are at the same apartment complex. Um, there's a lot of repeating, um, you know, street names in the littles that we serve that are, are part of uh, the program specifically um, with Healthy Neighborhoods. And then with Southdale having been a new uh, seg segment, I guess, that was added this last year, we do have quite a few kids um, that are in that area, um, as well as on our wait list. Um, so I wanted to share kind of a demographic profile. Um, the left-hand column is our overall kids in the program versus the kids that are in the priority neighborhoods. And so this is who we've served so far this year. Um, 43 kids we've served from the priority neighborhoods, which is great. That's higher than what we had put in our grant application. So I think it indicates that there's a need there that we were able, um, and that there's still two more months in the year to serve quite a few kids in this area. Um, we have served, we will probably serve about 500 kids in the course of the year, but you can see that about 10% of our kids, these, you know, relatively small segments of our community, and it's countywide that we've served 469 kids, 10% of them are living in these priority neighborhoods. Um, there's, you know, a bunch of information on here, but I specifically want to call out um, the uh, kind of like demographic parts of um, of who we're serving in Fitchburg that are different than our overall kind of population that we're serving. So with race and ethnicity, the majority of the kids that we serve overall in our program are youth of color, 84% um, that we have served so far this year, but you can see in Fitchburg that it's 94%. So from a kind of racial and ethnic diversity standpoint, we have a lot more, um, I guess, density of people of color that we're serving in the priority neighborhoods than our program more generally. Um, and those same that, that same kind of point applies when we look at the um, you know data points around uh, that reflect probably the economic stability of the family, um, whatever their kind of uh, socioeconomic position is that for free and reduced lunch, it's 74 percent of the kids in our program, but 88 percent in the priority neighborhoods. And it's hard to look at like low income without, you know, the exact number of people in the household. But if we kind of just set, you know, I, I looked at what the spread of household income was and all but one um, or maybe it was all but two of the um, littles that we served, all of their households made under $50,000 um, for their household income annually, and more than half checked the box for less than 10000 as the amount of money um, for their household income. Uh, and you compare that, it's still a significant in our overall program at 85%, but still more with the priority neighborhoods. Um, so this is the youth that we've served. We have uh, about 190 kids on our wait list for the community, which is a lot. Um, 17 of them or 18 of them are in the priority neighborhoods. So a similar representation, about 10% of our wait list is in this area. 
the demographic profile is pretty similar, but the two points that I want to call out of like the, um, this lingering need that we have on our wait list is that, you know, the kids we're serving, it's pretty evenly split male and female, but our wait list is almost two thirds male. And that reflects a shortage of male mentors that a lot of these boys want a, ma a male mentor. And because we have fewer men that step forward to be mentors, um, they end up waiting longer and there are more of them on the wait list. And that is compounded if they also want a male of color as their mentor, that the time that they're going to be waiting is significantly longer. Um, the other interesting data point that we found is that on our wait list, 17% um, of the littles that are um, in the priority neighborhoods have an incarcerated parent, um, which is only 10% um, in our overall program. I'm not quite sure why it's only 5% of our Fitchburg kids that are matched and 17% of those that are on our wait list. I was looking and it's not necessarily that those kids are harder to match. I think that kind of just might be a coincidence that, you know, more of those kids have not been matched yet. But regardless, between those that have matched and those that are on the wait list, there is a like decent number of kids who um, have a parent incarcerated or that's involved in the justice system. Any questions about like, this profile before I kind of briefly go over some of the like challenges that we're seeing and that we're hearing about from the families in our program. Hello. Great. Um, okay, so we, like I said- I have a question. 40... Oh, Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, are there uh, statistics around um, preferred language as far as um, English, Spanish? I mean, I, I, I don't know if there are other languages. Um, yeah, we do have that. It's not in the report that I pulled that I have open right now. Um, I believe if when I was looking at the race and ethnicity, it was like of the youth that were that are identified as people of color, it was like 55 or 60 percent were black. Um, and then um, portions from there that identified as Hispanic, um, two or more races. And so there is definitely, I know that there is a Spanish speaking representation. Um, I would guess that it is probably less than 25%, um, but could definitely look at that. We have specific staff that are, uh, Spanish speaking that work with our families that speak Spanish so that we're able to like properly support the, um, the parents or caregivers in those families. Um, and it's significant enough for us to have, um, you know, two staff that are dedicated to that, but I'm just not quite sure what that distribution looks like within the priority neighborhoods. I'd be happy to find out and let you know though. Great. Um, okay. So we kind of pulled to, you know, pulled out the kids that are in the program and, our match support specialists are our staff that work individually with the families. Um, when we make a match, we don't just send them out on their own. For the first year that they're together, we connect with the big parent and little every month for the year. And then after that year, we connect with them every quarter. And these conversations allow us a lot of opportunity. Obviously, we're ensuring that the match is like healthy, safe, and thriving. But we also get a lot of qualitative information about what's happening with the family and what's going on. There's plenty that doesn't get shared because it doesn't come up on those phone calls. Um, so this is certainly a sampling, but we pulled it out and kind of looked at some of the things that we knew were going on with some of the families. And I pulled out the patterns or trends that we're seeing across the board. Um, I put some specific examples of some of the families on here, but these three bullet points represent a really meaningful number of the families in our program. Um, I would say each of these, you know, the economic instability piece, when we look just at the statistics around the income of our families, we know that that's a factor, but for those where it seems like it's creating real acute uh, challenges for them with economic stability, exposure to violence and trauma and housing insecurity, I would guess that with each of these, from what I saw, we're talking about overall, there's probably 33 families represented in the program and each of these categories probably had between six and 10 families that were like affected by it in some way. So a pretty meaningful percentage of the families that we're serving. Um, so with economic stability, you know, I put a few samples on here. We have a mom with three kids. It's a single mom and is due with another child in November. Um, we have a parent who expressed that after their car broke down, she lost her job because she wasn't able to get there. And that it seems like life has kind of fallen apart since then um, for supporting her family. 
we have a single grandparent who is a caretaker of five grandkids. Um, three of them are in our program. Um, but what was really interesting is every year at Christmas, we, um, around the holidays, we do, we have people that donate money that want to support a family around the holidays. We try and find families that we know are having kind of acute um, economic challenges and, you know, not just give them the resources to uh, give gifts to their family, but also help pay some bills and alleviate some financial pressure around the holidays. We selected four families last year. Three of them live in the priority neighborhoods. And that's out of like the whole county of kids that we were serving that the families that were picked because of the needs, it turns out three of the four are kind of you know, centrally located here. Um, and I just thought that was an interesting piece of, you know, the things that we kind of start to uh, uncover when we look at this group together. Um, as far as exposure to violence and trauma, you know, some examples, there's a little whose older brother died by suicide and has, it's a pair of siblings with an older brother that died by suicide and another older sibling that has attempted. Um, uh, we have another match where the dad was shot a few years ago, and so not only was, um, and it was at the home, and they didn't feel safe in their home anymore, and so that kind of ties into the housing insecurity that the family, um, despite their financial circumstances, needed to find someplace else to be that they felt safe. Um, and then another one that ties into the economic piece, um, a little whose older brother passed away while his girlfriend was pregnant. Now the girlfriend and the toddler live with the family. Mom is not around very much because she is working three jobs to try and support and take care of everybody. Um, and that kind of ties into the housing and security piece too, right? Like all these things obviously connect to each other. Um, we have one family that was jumping around between hotels all summer um, that they would have to check in someplace and check out for a day before they'd be allowed to check back in again. Um, one little right now is experiencing homelessness and has recently moved in with his great grandma. Um, we're not quite sure how long that will last, but is good for now. Um, and then another parent that is unable to re-sign their lease because of how frequently the police were coming to their home. Um, and so, uh, they, during the summer had to be out for a period of time. They had to camp for a week. Um, so anyway, these are some of the examples of the situations that our families are experiencing. There's also a lot of examples of some of our families that are really thriving and our littles that are doing really well. This is obviously representative of like specifically looking at the challenges, but we also have a lot of, um, of really great families and support systems and a lot of thriving folks that are living in these neighborhoods, um, which I think is an important piece to call out when we're talking about um, things that are challenging. Any questions about any of these examples of what we're seeing in the community? So specific to like why mentoring, why the research shows that mentoring is a valuable intervention when we look at these challenges, um, a lot of our positioning we think through of this lens of adverse childhood experiences, the, the traumatic experiences that are occurring in childhood um, can be, you know, it's myriad of experiences, racism, economic instability, divorce, all these different things. But what the data shows is that the more ACEs that a child experiences, the greater likelihood they have of increased negative life outcomes, health issues, economic and educational um, struggles. Uh, engagement in risky behaviors. Um, and we also know that systemic inequities increase the likelihood of ACEs, right? That like being a person of color, the, the, the way that these other factors are compounded when they are faced with the systemic inequities that are built into a lot of what's around us. So when we look at that profile of our littles, when it comes to their family structure, um, their race, their economic um, situation, their is a lot that increases and situates our youth to be at much greater risk of experiencing a lot of these adverse childhood experiences and having there be a lot that kind of build on each other. When we look at that list of those challenges, a youth that's experiencing housing instability means that they're probably also experiencing economic instability, which means that they're probably also, right, like the, the compounding effect of all of these things. So, but research shows that mentoring as an intervention is really valuable in mitigating the effects of ACEs and serving as a buffer that protects against the worst consequences of trauma. Um, and so when we look at some of these really hard situations that our families are in, as much as we want to be able to solve all of the things, we know that the one thing that we can really do effectively and that we want to focus our resources and our time on is being present and consistent and stable for that little, for that youth that has a lot of other things that maybe won't be so stable in their life at that moment. Um, 
So to kind of like tie in of like what is making a difference in our ability to provide our services as well as how the community can respond, I think what's making a difference in our ability to create an impact in the prior neighborhoods to serve as many kids as we're serving um, one of the benefits is that it's really centrally located that by being kind of along the belt line right there, you know, we, we, we make matches where ideally the big is within about a 15 minute drive of the little that we know that longer distances and times make it harder for them to spend their time together because the prior neighborhoods are right there. Um, there are more bigs that are kind of quote unquote eligible for a match. Um, more bigs means more diversity of those bigs. Um, and we see that, that kids on the wait list in the Pride neighborhoods are only waiting 117 days to be matched. And our broader wait list is 191 days. So we're matching these kids much faster, um, which is giving us, you know, the opportunity to provide more services for this as our target audience. Um, and we're also getting more diversity, which matters for those littles that want someone that maybe looks like them, right? That 23% of our priority neighborhood bigs are people of color. It's only 13% um, in the rest of our program. So we have a more diverse and a more kind of quickly engaging group of bigs that's coming and, and able to support this these neighborhoods. Um, we also have caregivers in these neighborhoods coming to us when their kids are younger. So our waitlist broadly, the average age is 9.7, so almost 10 years old. But of the priority neighborhood, the kids on our waitlist are 8.5 um, years old on average. So getting them started with a mentor younger um, increases the effectiveness of that mentoring. And so we're excited to see parents coming when their kids are younger and trying to secure services um, at a young age. We're also uh, restarting a program in partnership with Wright Middle School, which has kids in the primary neighborhoods that feed there. We only have four matches starting out at the beginning of the school year, but two of them are from the primary neighborhoods and gives us an opportunity to collaborate with the schools to um, make sure that our services are going where they're most needed. And when we look at this group of matches, they're really committed. We have parents that are highly engaged. We have a lot of parents that have two or three kids in the program. We have bigs that are coming to events. Like when these all these parties are engaged, it's going to make for longer and ultimately more impactful mentoring, um, which is what we want. So to kind of wrap up, um, like what would help? What are the things that this committee, that the city, that our community can be doing? There's a piece of like what would help for the community, but then what helps for our agency? What helps for the community is obvious. It's the stuff that you all are probably already doing and focused on, but looking at the needs of our families, it is resources to help those that are experiencing economic instability, especially for single parents and making sure that their kids don't suffer um, kind of the, the consequences of the instability that might be happening with their parents um, or with their caregivers. Safe and affordable housing, um, the amount of stuff that's tied up in housing that it seems like our families are experiencing is really significant and just creates challenges in our continuity of care, I suppose, when families are, um, you know, kind of bouncing to different places around the city. Um, and then I think specifically looking at our youth, more mental health services for youth that are being, um, you know, exposed to trauma, violence, um, instability, and uh, doing what we can beyond mentoring to help bolster uh, the youth in our community. As far as our specific agency, what would help us serve more kids and be even more effective? More male, male volunteers, more mentors, um, especially men of color. This would go a long way in reducing the wait times for littles. Looking at the 18 youth that we have on our wait list, five of them have been waiting since 2022. And all five of them, it's related to the fact that they want a male person of color as their mentor. And we only have so many. And so um, that is a, a, the biggest uh, difference maker, I think, that would help us um, create more matches more quickly. Um, and then from just kind of an operational standpoint, you know, whether it's the grant we receive from you or other grants um, in our community, we are grateful for all funding that comes our way. It is sometimes challenging when there are um, nearly all of our services are tied up in our staff and um, the expenses that come with having those individualized one to one conversations. And so finding more opportunities to secure funds that are able to go towards staffing and support personnel um, gives us the flexibility to make sure that we're providing the really meaningful um, match support that helps get this information, helps us refer families to services, helps us make sure that we're resourcing them as much as we can. So that's a lot of information about Big Brothers Big Sisters and what we're doing. I know there are others to speak tonight. Any questions about our work or additional information that um, I can speak to to help as you all are doing your strategic planning? Yes, Ryan. 
Thank you, Jill. That was really informative and very helpful. I appreciate all that information, all the work that you did putting that uh, together. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a question about, you know, uh, what, what do you think is helpful? What is, what do you guys need to get more um, male mentors of color, to, in your opinion? Um, it's a really, it's a really good question. We um, had had a volunteer recruitment position years ago that was vacated at the beginning of the pandemic, and we didn't refill for a bit as we were figuring out what our needs were and what the right investment is. We rehired that position last year, um, and the individual Tracy that's in that position has been here for a year, and so we've been learning a lot about what is effective, um, and we're really excited to see that the needle is moving and that that overall number. Um, of people of color coming to our agency broadly um, is improving from what it was last year. But I don't feel like we have identified like what the strategy is. We're doing a lot of things right now and we're seeing the needle move, but it's, I don't feel like we have the data yet to be able to isolate what things are happening. I think um, building our network of folks who have diverse networks, you know, we're trying, you know, um, targeted connection with groups that um, are, you know, kind of uh, more representative in our city, you know, can we get in front of them, I, but we're also mindful of groups and kind of coalitions of people of color that get pulled on in a lot of different ways at a lot of different times, and there are a million different priorities. And so I think figuring out how to leverage the connections that we have, and for people that have connections to come forward and say, I would be happy to try and coordinate a time for you to connect with folks to, you know, learn about what the specific need is. Um, so the answer to your question is, I don't know. Um, but I think, uh, continuing to express what our need is in the community and getting folks that are, uh, that feel compelled by that to want to kind of act and help open doors, um, is going to be a lot of what we're hoping to see over this next year. Thank you. Yeah. I, I kind of suspected it would be a tough thing to answer. We're, we're moving. I just can't say what specifically is uh, helping you move. Any other questions? Yes, Caitlin. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if you um, study impact on mentors in addition to men littles. Yeah, we, so the assessments and tools that we use come from Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, which is great because they um, can afford to put like research and have evidence based tools without us having to be the ones to develop them. Um, and so in our kind of data collection, there is surveying that we do every year to the big and the little where we are able to get some of that information from the big, um, but it's not as it's a lot more about like the strength of the relationship than it is about like the bigs expression of impact on their end. And so I know that these are conversations that are happening on the national level as local organizations like ours are saying, we wanna be able to report on this because um, that type of impact both on the big, we also are interested in putting, you know, trying to develop a stronger case for support for like why, you know, you as a company, um, your your employees being involved in volunteerism and being involved as mentors helps your employees, it helps your workforce, you know, you should help us promote this, like trying to figure out cases for support that are more than just that there's a community need that are about an individual's interest, a business interest. Um, so I know there are conversations happening about that. And we have some feedback from bigs, but not a data set as um, as broadly as we would like to have to show the bigs um, kind of, yeah, quantitative uh, takeaways of the bigs experience. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Um, I'm going to, I'll close out here and, um, turn my camera off. I don't have reason to stay on, but I am going to pull my spreadsheet back up really quick. And I'll just throw in the chat if I'm able to um, pull a number of preferred language in the household just to put a period on the end of that sentence. So if anything else comes up as you all are doing your planning, um, you know, Deanna has my information. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we're so grateful for this work, grateful for the priorities that you all have identified. Um, and as, you know, grateful recipients of that support, if there's anything in our storytelling, in our data um, that we can do to help kind of color in the work that you're doing in, um, in this community, we're happy to do so. So please don't hesitate if there's anything we can do to help. 
appreciate it a lot. Uh, that was a lot of info and incredibly uh, useful, uh, for sure. So, <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, next up, uh, we'll talk with uh, uh, Abba Thakar. Thakar. Uh, sorry if I uh, mispronounce that. Uh, please correct me. Uh, from Mosaic uh, Early Childhood Zone. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Uh, or rather, Absolutely. joining us yeah. via Zoom. That's right. So my name is Abba Tucker, no problem. It doesn't look like that at all. So, <laughs> um, And uh, really nice to be here. So I am with the Dane County Early Childhood Zones. Um, my Mosaic is the name of my uh, consulting firm. So I actually am, was hired by the collaborative to serve as um, sort of the backbone organization uh, through the collective impact model that we use. Um, and so I act as sort of the convener, facilitator, coordinator, um, and helping all the different partners uh, get the work done that we want to do. So um, I was invited here today, I think, because of the role that uh, the neighborhood navigators in Fitchburg play um, in the early childhood zones. And so just wanted to share a little bit about what the programs are. Um, and I don't have quite the same incredibly impressive breakdown of data <laughs> that Jill had, um, but I actually do have some about the Leopold families that we serve. Um, so I'm just going to start with kind of an overview of what it is, uh, and I'm going to use the materials that you would have access to anyway. So we um, have our website. Is this, are you seeing that right now? Okay, great. Um, so this is eczdane.org is the website. Um, and I'm just dropping that in the chat. I don't know who has access to that, but if you'd like to um, go there at any point. So basically what the early childhood zones are, um, it's a model that, um, you know what, I'm actually going to start with a different document because I think that there's one that will be more useful for the e explanation. Um, so um, essentially what the early childhood zones are, it's a model that um, serves families with children under the age of four, um, and at the center of it are um, seven home visiting programs. Now, what's interesting about that is that those home visiting programs are technically open to anyone in Dane County. You do not have to live in the geographic area of the zone. Um, so, but what we've done then is we've looked at certain neighborhoods that have a high concentration of families that, you know, have this level of need and have kind of carved out these geographic zones. So there's actually three different zones throughout Dane County. Um, one of them is in, Leop in the Leopold Elementary School attendance area. Another is in the north side of Madison, and that includes the attendance area of four elementary schools there because they're quite a bit smaller than Leopold. Um, and then we also have a zone for the city of Sun Prairie. So those are the three zones. And what makes it a little different, right, is residents are actually um, able, they're, they're qualified for these services no matter where they live. There's a variety of agencies such as Forward Service Corporation, Children's Hospital that provide employment and education, housing case management, you know, um, the Community Action Coalition, uh, the Rainbow Project provides our therapy services, all of these organizations serve families, whether that you live in the zone or not. The difference um, with being in a zone is that you get connected to a home visiting program, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, and then your home visitor can actually connect you to dedicated staff within the zone. So you sort of get bumped up in the queue so that if you need, um, again, any of these support services, you have priority and we have dedicated staff that just serve those attendance or those uh, geographic areas. So um, so what that really means then is that, it, well, in addition to um, dedicated staff, we actually have dedicated resources, so for uh, funds. So for example, under housing case management, um, we have a pot of money that families in the Leopold attendance area who are in home visiting can um, access on an emergency basis, for example, to help with a housing application or a rent payment or something like that. So if you live outside of the zone, you can still call CAC and get housing support, but you don't get the fast track and you also don't have those extra resources available. 
Now, in an ideal world, we would find a way to remove that scarcity and let give access to everyone, right, to some of these um, amplified resources. But we really wanted to, this was kind of a, a pilot. It actually was launched by um, a then County Executive Kathleen Falk to kind of have focal neighborhoods. So the navigators in this system actually, you'll see, um, help us with outreach and community referrals. And so they do um, a lot of our relationship building in the community. The hope really is that because they are embedded in neighborhoods and they have, you know, trusting relationships that they can act as a bridge to connect families to the home visiting programs, which again are kind of the hub of the program. Um, so some of the goals, right, of the zones, there's actually, this is a really lovely um, graphic that I'll share next. Um, the zones are organized around what are known as the protective factors. Um, and this is a, a framework that's actually used all over the country. Um, and its primary focus is strengthening families to reduce instances of child abuse and neglect. Um, and so this, if we were to, for those of you who um, are, you know, are familiar with nonprofit speak, this is like the, the in our logic model, this is the point. <laughs> like, this is like where we are trying to go. And so you'll see the five protective factors, our knowledge of parenting and child development. That's a lot of what happens in the home visiting programs. Um, is that they work with parents and children together, birth to four, actually pregnancy to four, to help parents feel yeah. skilled, to like really be attuned to their children's developmental stages, to be aware of those developmental stages. And again, we try to be really responsive to children with different abilities. So it isn't just this uniform, this is where you should be at in development, but it's sort of like, what does development look like for your child, right? And how do, how can we help support that? And how can you as a parent help support that? Um, other protective factors include resilience, specifically of families, um, of parents, of helping them cope with stressors of everyday life. Another protective factor is concrete support. So in that model I showed you, this is where the housing support comes in. This is where the mental health services, the education and employment, then social connections. And you'll hear that a lot of our families, their home visitor is one of their primary um, supports in many ways and and gives helps them develop that. But we actually offer other opportunities within the zones like we do parent cafes so parents can connect with each other and um, really share it's actually they're really terrific events like I love as a parent I find them so lovely because I like we talk about there's there's a, there's a sort of circle process where you get to invite parents to share their experiences around different topics and there's like great wisdom <laughs> families all over the place where I'm, like, oh, I'm gonna go home and try that <laughs> Um, and then social and emotional competence is the other uh, protective factor. So then if you see our website, um, you'll kind of get the overview here, right? So this is where we have the Northside Zone and its attendance areas, Leopold, um, and then the city of Sun Prairie. So our different home visiting programs come from... Um, I think it's four or five organizations. I should know that number off the top of my head, but it's a combination of public health, uh, RISE, uh, Reach Dane, and then all, uh, and then Children's. So that's four organizations with seven different home visiting programs, and they all have slightly different um, eligibility depending on the age of the child. Like, so for some, it's during pregnancy that you can get started for some, you know, and then that ends at two weeks or two months in, um, and then you can actually be picked up by another home visitor. You can only, though, for all the home visiting programs in Dane County, you're only eligible for enrollment in one at a time. Um, but once you have that connection, again, this is where we can then connect you to housing case management. Um, in this case, CAC and Sunshine Place and Sun Prairie. Education and employment is Children's and Forward Service. And then mental health is the Rainbow Project. And actually RISE provides um, some mental health services too. So, and here you can see kind of all the different partners at the bottom of our website. Um, so I'm trying to think, oh, just some stats, just to give you a sense then. So the um, Leopold 
zone serves anywhere from about 27 to 35 families at a time, kind of in and out. It's so it's it isn't huge, right? And there's room at the moment. I think that our programs have, you know, they tend to have a number of openings. And so this is again where the navigators are really great for helping us kind of do that outreach. And we're trying to better integrate you know, them into the zone structure and process to, to really support that. Um, out of those 27, so for example, we currently have 27 families that serve 63 children within those households. 70% um, actually are enrolled in the housing support services. As you know, that housing is actually a point of great stress nowadays um, with costs being so prohibitive for families. And so that is generally like a motivating factor for people to get connected to the zones because the housing services are so valuable. 63% um, are enrolled in education and employment. Um, and then we currently only have about seven to 10% receiving mental health services. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there for expansion. We have um, openings in those programs. Um, and I think we're sort of constantly learning about ways to talk about mental health support that um, sort of works with some of the stigma around it, right? And helps families feel comfortable accessing that. Um, and then just in just to kind of give you a very quick sense of who accesses these programs, um, this is our 2022 report. So at the end of the year, we'll have a new demographic report. But last year, we served 31 families in Leopold. Of the total ECZs, so this is where we don't um, have a breakdown zone by zone, but you can see kind of what the demographics are. So 58% had incomes less than 18,000, um, whereas 23% were at 25,000 or more. Um, we have 54% English speakers, 36% Spanish speakers. We actually currently, we've been translating brochures and we've been getting requests for, um, you know, Arabic and Swahili and French and um, I believe tie in the Leopold zone. Um, so we've been really working to, with our language, we have a language access policy now, and we've really been working to like expand both on the front end of outreach and on the, the back end of all of the processes to make sure we can serve folks. Um, you'll see that the family size, this one was actually really interesting. When I looked at the Leopold numbers specifically, um, Leopold had more um, adults in the households uh, than the other zones did. And um, maybe that has something to do with the demographic makeup of your neighborhoods um, and family structure there. Um, so that that was a really interesting piece. We saw a lot more single parent households in the other two zones, or, and it's possible these are single parent households, but might have a grandparent living with them or something. Um, and then um, the majority are fa of our families are not homeless, but we do actually have contingents because it's a geographic based program, <laughs> but we do have support in place when we encounter a family who's experiencing homelessness. Um, most are experiencing food share, um, and many are not receiving a child care subsidy. So I think that kind of the summary of what we've learned in this is that um, we child care is a huge, huge unmet need. And every time we talk about trying to increase resources for it, what we discover is we don't have a ton of providers to even pay um, for those services, um, but but generally the the Leopold Zone has been a pretty successful active program, um, and I think we if we're seeing a, ri a rise in demand, I think we actually that so for example if we start to see wait lists piling up in Le Leopold, I think we actually have funders who are willing to expand those services. So just planting that seed you know, for Fitchburg to be thinking about, like, if they, if there's a sense that this is important, like, if we're beginning to see demand, we can actually advocate and possibly grow um, some of the opportunities in the zone. So, yeah, any questions? Ryan? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Right. I do have a couple questions. Uh, 
Do you have a map for the uh, Leopold zone? Maybe you did. There's a lot of information. First of all, great information. Thank you very much. Do you sure. did you have a map up on the screen? I'm I'm just curious. I, maybe not. Um, Yes, I do, in <laughs> fact. So the Leopold Zone is um, actually the um, MMSD Leopold attendance area for the elementary school. Okay. So um, so what I can do, I just pulled it up on MMSD, and I can show you that. Um, one second. Attendance area. By so school. for the most part, then, it, it, it definitely overlaps into Fitchburg, then, because it's MMSD. Yes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Um, yeah. And, yeah, and you, totally. you, great. And you mentioned that um, currently there's 27 to 30 families served in the Leopold zone. That, yeah. that, that correct? Yes, that's right. Right now we're at that. That data was second quarter. We tend to see a lot of new enrollment in the third and fourth quarter. So at the time it was 27. Um, but sure. it, like last year, I think we were at 31 or something. That's about right. Okay. Uh, and, and I believe you answered the question, but I just wanted to make certain. So, yeah. that twenty-seven or, or thirty-one or whatever that whatever it is, is that is that a, is that a, is that a, I'm not sure how to phrase the question. Is that a max at this point? So, does that number continuously change, or do you have a cutoff because of a lack of funding? So it's a so th there is a a ceiling, right? So the seven home visiting programs have enrollment caps just based on staff caseloads. Sure. So, um, and there's actually a fair amount of flexibility in that um, because we have um, uh, staff in Leopold are actually welcome to serve families outside of the zone, though not, they won't have access to those enhanced services outside of home visiting so the so and so if they end up getting more enrollment in leopold they can switch their caseload over to leopold and if we need more funding if it turns out we're seeing a really high demand we actually have funders who are willing to to support expansion so some of that's actually conversations we continue to have as we monitor mm -hmm. um, the usage okay well very good again great information it's another another, another great program so thank you for sure. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I actually have a, a question. Um, so, I mean, it's, it seems like the program relies uh, pretty heavily on the neighborhood navigator interfacing with the community and providing those referrals into the program. Um, I guess uh, my, my question would be, uh, you know, right now, Fitchburg has the single neighborhood navigator who is central in, in and focused on the, the Leopold neighborhood. Um, is there uh, any, I guess, interest or, uh, you know, potential um, to expand maybe into some of the other neighborhoods in Fitchburg that are, uh, we are focusing on as a, a Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative? Um, if there were a, na a neighborhood navigator in that neighborhood who could, you know, facilitate in the same way as the, the Leopold neighborhood? Yeah, I'm actually wondering if Deanna also wants to help me answer that question. So <laughs> the navigators are funded through Dane County yeah. and they were that program was originally designed in large part, as we talked about, for outreach for the zones. However, they have their scope of what they can do in terms of supporting other connecting activities um, is broader than just the zones too. So I actually am curious, I see, um, okay, it seems like Deanna can do that. <laughs> uh, do you want to share now, Deanna? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, so um, I, I think that, of course, the neighborhood navigators are funded through Dane County specifically to support this program, the Early Childhood Zone. Um, we have been working with Megan, um, and she is, is our point person at Dane County to further refine um, the work of the neighborhood navigators. But it's important to understand that the neighborhood navigators, their purpose is to support the early childhood zone and the early childhood zone is the Leopold School, which is North Fish Hatchery area. Okay, so that's the funding train here, <laughs> if that kind yeah. of makes sense. The, um, and so uh, historically, the neighborhood navigators have had um, s less clarity 
in their work, I guess, but we have been working to make sure that the dollars from Dane County are definitely supporting the early childhood zone itself. So does that make Nope, and a lot of that was on our end, honestly. <laughs> the zones, we did not have a great organizational structure. <laughs> so I, that's part of why they brought me on. So we've been trying to provide support right. and slowly over the course of the last six months, we've been building in all these mm -hmm. things, right? For better yes. communication. Um, I will say I piloted the neighborhood navigator program on the north side about seven years ago now. And, you know, the beauty of it is as a model for outreach and for connection, it can be incredibly powerful. And so if it turns out that you find that valuable, you know, you can certainly, you know, find other sources of funding and hire additional navigators mm -hmm. for other aspects of the work, right? So I think that like this particular part of the navigate, you know, these, the navigator you currently have is funded through Dane County for the zones, but it doesn't mean you can't expand it through other ways, right? Other means. Um, Cause when I had, when we ran that on the North side, I actually had seven navigators that were funded through, I think it, at that time it was five different funding sources. So I could kind of use them flexibly for like a lot of different projects mm -hmm. and get them engaged in a lot of different neighborhoods. And so certainly an op option. I mean, I don't want to volunteer your staff, <laughs> but I'm just saying that's no. a possibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ava. Um, I think that helps to clarify. So our, our current neighborhood navigator program is funded by Dane County to support the early childhood zone in the Leopold School zone. Okay. Great. Yeah, that, that's a good distinction to make um, and kind of sets uh, the, the understanding of where we are now and uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> imagining what could be maybe. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that childcare is a huge unmet need. Um, what are you finding for um, access to food and um, fresh vegetables and yeah, food? Yeah, I so appreciate that question. I'm actually on the team that is, we just received a significant amount of funding to develop a regional food systems plan. So this is very much um, I'm very attuned to this, like in the zones as well as in other parts of the county. Um, so I think that the emergency food system has received a lot of, of support because of the pandemic, right? A lot of money flowed in through that. And we saw, so for a while there, we actually saw an abundance of access. And then that started to get pared back. And we started to see inflation playing a major role in, and then of course, um, you know, food share was cut back to benefits were cut back to pre pandemic levels. So families have definitely entered a new state of crisis again. Um, and the food pantries are seeing really high demand. Um, second harvest is about to get millions of dollars through the county budget um, from some remaining ARPA funds, which in that's the region's food bank. So that should really support food pantry purchases. Um, and, you know, ideally, we're not relying on an emergency food system to feed people. Right? So the goal here is to get to a point where that is not, you know, obviously, so that's its own issue, but which is why we're doing some of those food systems resilience work. So I think that because of the demographics of the families we see in the zones, yes, food insecurity is huge, but so is housing insecurity, right? So is healthcare insecurity, all these different issues. And so the question is for families always, where do we put our limited resources? And if we're not going to put it here, it means we're going to put it, you know, if, if we are going to put it here, it means we're not going to put it here. So that's where, for example, in a given month, if a family gets a housing subsidy like from CAC and helps them pay their rent, then maybe they have more money to buy food. In a different month, maybe they're putting all their money into food purchase, you know. So I think it really, honestly, they're just juggling it all the time. And yes, it is a serious issue for families ongoing. But vegetables are, there's opportunities for it. And some of this is connect, right? There's a lot of like, um, for example, Rooted is working hard to disseminate locally grown vegetables to neighborhoods that need it. Um, 
and some of that is about building all the connections and communication to get it to the people who need it. So that's always in the works in terms of infrastructure and distribution. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> it's a big one. All right, uh, and any other questions? I think. Uh, I have a couple. Great. Um, one of the, you mentioned um, the cost of housing, which of course uh, is something that most of us are really well acquainted with. Um, I, I've been following pretty closely the Bayview product, project in Madison. How is that affecting that neighborhood at this point? I mean, I know it's only very part way done, but um, is that providing the uh, housing opportunities that lower income people need? So I can speak to this only because of my relationships. I'm actually not officially connected to Bayview, right? But I, but what I can say is this, is Bayview tends to have their population, um, from my understanding, is long-term. It's folks who've been there for a really long time. They have enormous wait lists for, I mean, that housing development is stunning and it is a revolution in resident-led affordable housing design and development. And we just featured them actually at YWCA's Racial Justice Summit for the way they did that process. And like, so it is phenomenal and ideally will become a model, right, everywhere. Um, the Bayview Foundation, um, you know, has, anyway, there were some resources there to start with and then they did a phenomenal job raising more, but there are wait lists. I mean, their families tend to be longtime residents there and I'm not sure what the turnover rate really is, which is part of the point is stable housing. So, yeah. Right. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask you, which is um, completely unrelated, <laughs> but you had, had also talked a bit about childcare. And um, you said one of the problems that you're having uh, is finding providers. So is uh, what kind of providers are you typically looking for? Are you looking for like a childcare center or somebody who maybe takes care of six kids in their home? or maybe a nanny or something to that effect. What what are the types of uh, providers that you're looking for? Oh, any of it, honestly. <laughs> like, I mean, we have tried, we've done, for example, in the North Side Zone, we actually did a really thorough canvas of home-based providers in order to help provide support. I mean, we had resources to help them develop their businesses. And there were very few who were doing it or ones that wanted to emerge. Because part of what happens is once you self-identify questions about like how many children you're watching and capacity and licensing come up. And so some stay underground because they can't afford. I mean, licensing a child care center is possibly one of the greatest bureaucratic nightmares you will ever face. <laughs> and it's expensive. And so a lot of folks will not come out from underground in their child care provision. And so, but even then, I mean, we, what we try to do is we tell families, whoever is providing child care for you, we will reimburse them. So if it's your mother providing child care for your children, we will pay your mother. If it is your sister, if it is your best friend, right? And so, and even then families tell us, I can't find anybody. I mean, it's, it's hard enough. And so what we need, and part of that, honestly, it's that childcare as a model of a for as a for profit model just doesn't work. Like there is an enormous amount of data and research on this, and it needs. I mean, I'm not even trying to be political, but it just needs to be publicly supported because there there isn't a financial model that works for this. So there is a total dearth in. I mean, the wait lists for childcare are also enormous in Dane County, and and there is practically no third shift, second or third shift. And so think about all the families that need that um, in order to maintain their jobs, and there's nothing really available for that either. And then, of course, it's how much we pay child care providers, which is pretty miserable. So 
the whole thing is a very broken system. But so if we could just find anybody that is safe, we would like to help our families get childcare. And it's very difficult. I can add to that. I, I, um, my understanding too, is that uh, the pandemic really had an impact as well on the number of um, childcare providers around. I know a lot of, a lot of places closed down, a lot of um, folks are doing in-home child care. They, they, they didn't have uh, children to, uh, to watch. And so they ended up getting different jobs. And so that really, I think we're still recovering from the impact of the pandemic. Yep. And now with inflation, and I think some of the cultural shifts since the pandemic, a lot of folks are not willing to go back because it, it you can't make ends meet on it anyway. So yeah, we lost, I mean, the numbers are astonishing how many child care providers we lost during the pandemic. I haven't kept yeah, up on, uh, oh, sorry, Jay, go ahead. I, I have, no, it's okay. I, I can't see what's going on there because I'm driving, but um, it does seem like there's, uh, it does, I think your assessment is absolutely correct that there just isn't a for-profit way to make this work. And that's the same, I think that's the same thing with other, with other issues going on in our society right now that just relying on the marketplace to provide these things makes it prohibitively expensive and uh, in other cases makes it just a disaster to try to manage. So I do think we need to have uh, greater uh, public resources going into this. The question is, how do we make that happen? Um, do, do we have, do we have like Dane County? Does Dane County open up its chi own child care facility? And then, you know, you've got the issues of, well, where is it going to be? Because people have to get their children there. So then you have transportation issues. And um, I, there's a, what, what do you, like if you could wave a magic wand, what would you do to solve this issue? Well, I don't know how much the committee wants to get into this. I will just, I will say we have a model that is actually really good and it's early head start and it's federally funded and it's incredibly impactful in terms of outcomes for, for children at that, you know, school readiness. So there, you know, just like we have a model for, for Medicare, for health insurance for everyone, we have a federal model for child care. Um, so I'll just leave it at that <laughs> for this meeting, I think. But yeah, no, Jay, those are great questions. And yes, big ones. Uh, excellent. Uh, it, I guess my comment was not was a, a little off topic uh, as well um, for, for this committee. So I'll just uh, refrain. Uh, any other questions at all? I don't see anything. Uh, thank you very much, Abba. That was yeah, for sure. A lot Thanks of great information. Me. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, well, uh, we have our last uh, guest here to talk with us, uh, Tiffany Loomis, here in person. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Tiffany is vice president of operations for Boys and Girls Club of Dane County. Sorry, I. Oh, give you fine. your title. Uh. You're fine. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to give an overview of what the Boys and Girls Club is. Um, and um, I really focused on food security tonight because that is one of the programs that the city of Fitchburg definitely supports us in. <clears throat> so our mission at the Boys and Girls Club is to inspire and empower, empower all young people, um, especially those that need us most. Um, to reach their full potential as productive, responsible, and caring adults. We really lean into our values within our programs and our services um, with compassion, innovation, integrity, respect, and accountability. The Boys and Girls Club at Dane County, we serve youth ages two and a half to 24 is our demographic um, for, for ages. But our allied facility specific located in Fitchburg, we start at age five. But we are um, in partnership with Verona School District that we will be opening our first 4K classroom, hopefully next academic year. So um, we will be lowering our age at that facility as well. Last year, 
We served over 1,100 youth throughout all of my programs that I oversee, as well as um, over 8,000 people through events, programs, um, and different, different things that we offer throughout the year. At our clubs, we provide innovative program designs to empower our youth um, to excel in school, become good citizens, um, and to lead healthy, productive lives. We accomplish this through Boys and Girls Club of America based programs and initiatives. So we focus on character and leadership, the arts, health and wellness, as well as sports recreation and education components. The city of Fitchburg as a funder of our food security programs, first of all, I wanna thank you and we appreciate all the support we have received through this initiative. Um, the Fitchburg Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative has been very impactful in the community. Um, it has allowed us to provide services historically that we may have not provided um, prior to the pandemic um, in, this, in this scope um, and collaboration that has developed through this program as well. So at Boys and Girls Club, um, our food security programming, we provide a daily meal every day in our program. In preschool, we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In our after-school model, which is during the academic year, we serve a hot meal every night for our youth program, as well as an additional meal to our teen programs. Last year, we served over 30,710 meals through programming and community-based events. Our collaboration continues to grow with the Allied Dunn's Marsh Neighborhood Association, Allied Fresh, the Bradger Prairie, Second Harvest, as well as the Allied Food Pantry, which is located within the Allied facility. Um, some of our community-based events that we have done this year to support the overall community is the community basketball tournament, uh, back to school event. We've hosted the Allied Community Meal within our center. And just as recently as last night, we had a Halloween family night, as well as we supported a community event this weekend in providing meals to the community. Coming up next is our annual Sina Davis Give Thanks event, where we're gonna serve over 700 people on Thanksgiving at Allied with a, a home cooked meal. And we could not do this without the support of the city of Fitchburg. We also have our drive through event, which started during COVID. Um, where we will reach 250 families with meals that they can produce their own Thanksgiving meals uh, the week prior to, to the Thanksgiving holiday. So some of the challenges that I've identified, I actually worked with Janice Ferguson um, from the Allied Food Pantry as well as Allied Fresh. So I may not have all the data um, that you may need, um, but I can definitely follow up and get you any data um, as well. But really, some of the challenges is access to fresh, free, fresh um, and healthy food, as well as household items. Funding, which we all know is an area, right, that um, supports these. Um, but it really, it really, for us to be able to support distribution, there's so many things that go into this. And I think that's something we really learned during COVID, right, is do you have food safety things in mind? when you're distributing food. Uh, a freezer truck can cost you $600 to rent for a day. So if you think about dis distributing to a community or if you don't have the on-site storage to make sure food is food safe, there's the, all these things that you have to take into account that you're not really thinking of you know, as, as you're doing these until you start to really plan it out. Um, we know product is expensive, especially if it's a healthy alternative. We know staffing is additional cost to do special initiatives as well as the supporting um, items needed. Transportation is also um, a challenge um, in the Allied Duns Marsh neighborhoods area. Um, it produces barriers um, to be able to access larger food pantries or larger grocery stores. It can take up to 45 minutes on a bus to be able to access those areas that you're choosing to shop. I think one of the other challenges is knowledge of resources. Um, oh, being aware of the resources, moving into a new community, 
not really knowing who to go to, where to find this information. Um, so overall, just awareness of the resources that are available. The Allied Neighborhood is a, is a transient community. There's a lot of new faces. There's a lot of new relationships that need to be built. During COVID, it was very hard to build relationships because everyone was not engaging in community-based events, face-to-face -face interactions, meeting your neighbor, finding out where these resources are. So I feel that that really set us back in, in that community specifically with being able to really support the overall community in, in certain initiatives. Language barriers is, is an, also, an area um, that we need support in. Community engagement support, funding here comes up, bringing the community together, that costs money. Could I? You know, what is the draw to be able to, you know, get the community together? And there's no better way than around food. Food is a natural way to sit down and get to meet everybody and have those conversations. Uh, feedback sessions, I feel, are, are a challenge, is trying to get in front of the community to actually get feedback and be able to hear what is needed and what supports. I think some of the potential opportunities we have is, you know, in, in increasing access, is continuing, you know, as a city, continuing to support those that are collaborating and building on collaboration to work together to serve more. Nobody can do this work alone. I couldn't, I couldn't do half of the things that we've done within the club without Allied Fresh, without the Allied Food Pantry, um, without the Allied Dunsmarsh Neighborhood Association. Second Harvest has been absolutely an amazing partner for many years um, in supporting our food initiatives as well. We need to reach more people because we know there's more, there's more that aren't being served. We, we need a, a way also to be able to communicate through a system where all the resources are, are available and accessible. This is one thing we really struggle with, I think, is a lot of it's word to mouth um, and where, ac where you can access things, where you can get things, hours of operation, a referral process. I think uh, a resource management you know, through, through Fitchburg, being able to refer people to a, a, to a place where they can access um, up-to-date information. Um, and also having many languages available with that resource. Community engagement support, definitely increased funding for food, equipment, and supplies needed to be able to serve the community well um, and provide access. Um, and I think also Having a rotation of resource agencies available at the Allied Food Pantry, as well as the Boys and Girls Club during events, being able to have that space where they can meet, they can meet the community and be able to talk about their resources um, is, is an area that I think that we could all definitely improve upon. That is all I have today, but I want to thank you very much for all your support over the many, many years in supporting not only the Boys and Girls Club, um, but the, the allied community. He, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also would love to clarify, you mentioned now twice, um, something about, well, language barriers, and then you need help with that. And then also later on, you mentioned um, that you could use assistance with um, language access. So can you clarify a little bit more about um, what barriers you're seeing, how Fitchburg could support that, um, what uh, areas of family life this is impacting, um, just anything around language access challenges. Yeah, so I think it's even just being able to interpret materials to be able to, to give families. Um, I know at, at the food pantry, it's been brought to my attention. You know, there's many new immigrants with no English language skills, right? Being able to communicate, um, and it's um, mainly Spanish and Arabic. I believe are the two areas um, that, that they're needing the, more, the most support with. And really just making sure it's building a welcoming environment where every family feels represent, you know, there's representation available. Um, 
you know, and it's, it, it's hard when you, you're not able to communicate um, because the, the need may be bigger than, than we know, right? So they may be there at, at a food pantry or they may stop in and learn about enrollment. Um, but they, we're not being able to communicate, you know, it, it, it's really hard. Um, we do have staff just not on site 24 seven that are able to translate. We're very mindful, um, but we, we've really noticed in the food pantry, which is volunteer led, the food pantry at, at, at the Allied um, Center, it's, it's volunteer led. And that is, that is something that they're really wanting support in. Um, overall family access, um, you know, we, we are fortunate enough and we pride ourselves in serving a home cooked hot meal every day. And we know that this really helps families out. Um, you know, it, it's hard coming from work and hurry up and swing by to the club and grab your kids and then go home and cook dinner, right? And things like that. Also, we know when our members leave, we know that they had a great meal that night. Um, we, we support any family that comes to us with any type of food access. Uh, the pantry has been absolutely amazing with allowing us to go in and do what we need to do to, to support families. Um, but we, we don't know unless they ask, right? And I think having even more of those community-based conversations, you know, but you have to have a trusting relationship to actually open up as well, right? And, and have those conversations. Um, I know the allied community. I, I've worked out of that community for over 12 years. It has changed drastically. It is a wonderful community, um, but there are a lot of new faces and there are a lot of new people and lots of kids that we haven't reached yet. Um, so it's continuing to get out there and figuring out ways to partner even within the community to make sure every family knows that the Boys and Girls Club is here as a resource. And if we're not the resource you need, we can help you find it. Did that answer your question? I am. If I can contribute to the conversation too, thank you, Tiffany, for all that information. Um, and as Tiffany knows, and uh, I'll just mention this, that, you know, I used to work in the Allied Drive neighborhood um, as a community social worker. I'm, I'm not there uh, as much anymore, but it has, you know, recently, um, it has been, uh, I mean, historically, it's been kind of the, an area where, um, a lot of refugees have been um, have been placed or have been have been able to find housing. I mean, the thing about Ally Drive is, uh, for the most part, it, it's some of the most affordable housing uh, that's not subsidized um, in Madison. Um, and so, yeah, you get a lot of you get you get people from all over the world that um, wherever they're uh, coming from, they they you know, a lot of folks land on Allied, and so you have a bunch of different languages, so that can get really complicated. Um, and doing, out uh, that complicates with outreach and all the, and uh, contributes to, to the language access issues. Um, I, I do want to ask, Tiffany, um, so I know during the pandemic, uh, there was, you know, there, so there was this thing for the folks that don't know, there was uh, Allied Fresh. Um, I think, I, I think that was started during the pandemic, Tiffany, I believe. Correct, yep. Yeah, and so I know that they were, they were serving um, hundreds of families maybe? Yeah, so they, they serve, right now, they are serving 100 households per week in three different areas. Um, and they, they, are running, they are running out of, of food uh, very, very quickly. We've actually recently yeah. partnered, as well as the uh, Badger Prairie Network um, Boys and Girls Club, we have partnered um, to keep that funded through January um, to maintain um, and actually take on an additional, I believe, 25 families um, in the Brita area. Um, and we are actually, um, I'm in the process, I believe it starts Friday, um, we are moving Allied Fresh production to the Boys and Girls Club right now, which they're using Bradger Prairie, um, which is going to be able, we're hoping that we're able to continue to be strong partners and increase the number of families that we can serve over time. But funding is an area of concern, right? Um, but us being able to have production there and be supportive 
um, and looking at the, the food pantry as, as a whole. Um, the team has done an absolutely wonderful job. We've kind of reinvented how they run the pantry. Um, we have now moved to the gymnasium where we have tables and chairs set up, which is more welcoming than being in a hallway, right? Um, we're able to set out fresh produce and those things in the gym where families can shop. Um, Janice and the team have brought in um, lots of resources. Um, um, J Erica from JFF is there, I believe, every week. Um, but the food pantry is looking to expand. I mean, we, they're open one day a week. Like I said, though, it is volunteer-led. To be able to expand, to have more pantry hours, there is there are funds that are needed um, to do that. So there's a, a morning session where I believe they're serving over 60 families throughout the course of every week. Um, the morning is, is busier than the evening currently. We are in talks of incorporating our teen program to have a role in helping set up the evening pantry um, for a service learning opportunity for our teens to feel like they're a part of this um, as well. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff um, going on, I feel, in the community, and I feel that the partnerships are really growing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, we can't necessarily serve more, you know, without the funding either. Thank you, Ryan. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, yeah. Th thank you very much um, for all of that information. It's uh, it's good to know. I live in the Allied neighborhood, and uh, uh, for the last four years, and it's. Uh, it's a, a very interesting and busy and um, pretty uh, resilient neighborhood. But yeah, uh, I, I've I've personally done some some volunteer work helping um, with some of the some re resettled refugees and, and things. And mm -hmm. language barriers are a very real yeah. uh, issue uh, with trying to make sure that you understand what what families need and making sure that um, you can either get it for them or find them the, the resources that uh, are needed. Thank you so much. Okay. Back to the agenda. I think we're done with that. Uh, so we move on next. Um, report from department. That would be me. So um, a couple things that I would just like to draw your all attention to. Um, I'm gonna just pull up a couple of things here. Um, our forestry team has been planting trees in Southdale. Uh, so just very happy to show you a couple pictures. Um, uh, 10 trees were recently planted in Southdale. Um, and I'll just show a couple of pictures for you all. So. Just wanted to share that success, maybe. And another, I guess my, there we go. There we go. So uh, another thing on my, um, for you all, is we have, you might have heard about the BRT, um, the Bus Rapid Transit. Uh, and so the proposal for bus rapid transit that Dane County, in conjunction with the city of Madison and then also the city of Fitchburg, um, is proposing a north-south bus rapid transit line. Um, and we do have an upcoming meeting next Thursday at 5.30 um, at Main Space Suites um, at Hatchery Hill. And I think there's a pretty good map in here. I'll just grab that for you. Um, so you might be aware that there is the red line, the, the line A for bus rapid transit is um, the red line going east-west. And right now, the city of Madison and the city of Fitchburg are working on a grant proposal that would create the north-south line 
that would begin on the north side at the airport and then come through downtown and then right down Fish Hatchery into Fish in into Fitchburg. So um, right now we're there's the transportation engineers are still working out exact stops along Fish Hatchery, but right now what is being proposed is um, the southernmost extension would be um, McKee and Fish Hatchery. Um, it would do a little bit of a loop down there. Um, you might remember uh, Walgreens is at that corner of Fish Hatchery and McKee. Uh, the mayor, as you might be aware of, is a very strong supporter of trying to bring this bus line farther south um, all the way to the Civic Campus and City Hall. So. Mostly what I wanted to make a way, make you all aware of is that there is uh, a meeting coming up, and I guess I'm just kind of making things crazy here. Sorry about that. There is a meeting coming up on Thursday of next week at 5.30 um, at Mainstay Suites. So uh, another item that I'll just uh, draw your attention to, staff, is still working on the teen center, the next phase of the feasibility study for the teen center. Um, we're just finalizing the contract with EQT. Um, so as soon as we get that kind of settled, um, we'll move into uh, that actual feasibility study. And I, that's all I have, and I will take any questions. Do you have any update on the hub? I certainly do. Yes. Sorry, I should have brought that up. Yes. Um, so the hub, we're working through um, in the final construction documents right now. That's where we're at. Um, staff is still um, working through an option to uh, perhaps put in the covered shelter, a covered um, roof for the activity field there. So we're kind of working through whether or not to bring that forward to council. But we're in construction document stage. We are still very hopeful that in winter we can, or late winter, we can bid out the project and still hopefully start construction end of May, June is our still our goal. Okay, this is a really specific question, but um, I've been wondering for quite a while about a gender neutral bathroom in that hub. Oh. I assume that the designs have been finalized way <laughs> ago, long ago because I brought this up okay. about a year and a half ago and it's still not there. So I'm going to assume that's not happening. I don't have a good answer for you, Ari, so let me check on that. Cool beans. Thank you. Alrighty. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, any other announcements from anyone else? Uh, I would like to add something if I could. Sure. In the uh, 2024 budget, uh, the mayor has included uh, some additional funding for the Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative program, and there's a budget amendment right now uh, that we'll be voting on uh, in a couple of weeks to reduce that back down to the 2023 level. So um, the only thing I wanted to add is I, I would encourage all the members of this committee to send an email to the council and express your, uh, your support for the additional funding. We've, uh, we've routinely had more requests than what we've had funding for and um, I just think it's we need to keep we need to keep the money in there as the mayor has uh, uh, requested. So um, that was just one thing that uh, that I thought this committee could take some action on that might help. Yes, that's I very have a very helpful. Question for you. Yeah. Uh, can where can we find out um, more information on that? Is there, some, is there something, a place where we can go to find out more information? 
Yeah, the best place to go is if you go onto the city's uh, agendas and meetings page. Um, there is the committee of the whole meeting from last week. We went through all of the budget amendments. So you can go on there and you can, uh, you can find the agenda for that meeting. And then you can click on the specific uh, HNI thing, and it'll give you a couple of documents you can look at, and that will uh, it will give you the budget amendment number, and it'll give you the amount. I am like I said, I'm driving right now, so I don't have that information in front of me, but um, it, it's all there. Uh, you know, the the actual amendment to cut it back, and uh, that information is readily available there. Just be, just be prepared. There's 18 amendments. <laughs> and and I'll, I, I can provide a link to that information. I, I'm happy to email a link out to the committee with that information. All right. Uh, excellent. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, uh, any other uh, announcements or uh, things to talk about? Okay. Uh, none. Then uh, I guess we're looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. Seconded. I'll second. <laughs> all right. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Meeting is adjourned.